A couple of videos ago, we talked about the ugly truth of synths and YouTube, the chasm between the experience of playing a synth in the studio and then hearing the end product on video on YouTube. And I was loosely talking and having a little fun in the video and kind of used some terms very loosely and ideas loosely. And I was surprised by the reaction. So I've invited my friend, Chris Klein, a recording engineer and professor of music technology. And today we're gonna to talk technically about what's going on behind the scenes in YouTube compression. Stick with us. Hi, I'm Zach Marr. And I'm Chris Klein. And we are at Alamo Music here today in San Antonio, Texas. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button, turn your notifications. This is our Alamo Sound Lab, where we talk about all things music tech related. And today, we are gonna talk about what's going on with YouTube compression. And in order to get there, we need to talk about compression in general and the different types. And I am not a expert in this domain, so I've invited Chris Klein to educate me, and I hope anybody else that may be confused about what's going on with compression in the video domain. So, Chris, I'm gonna let you take it away, and I'm gonna ask questions as I try to elucidate my own understanding of it. Very good. Awesome. So, <laughs> talk about compression. What What are the different types? What are we What are we talking about when we talk about compression? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we've got audio dynamic range compression, which is the taming of your the dynamic range of an audio signal, right? Right. So you have peaks and valleys of your audio, and if you're in Pro Tools or a DAW, you can actually see these waveforms, right? If the peaks and valleys become too radical, then you might want to apply dynamic compression so you can take those peaks and bring them down and make the audio signal a little more manageable within your mix. Right. Or whatever the context is, right? So that's audio dynamic range compression. Now, we also have data compression. And with data compression, what we're doing is we're trying to take an audio file shrink it down, make it more portable so it's easier to transmit over the internet, whether it be a downloadable or streaming. Right. With that, the most common is the MP3 codec. And what the, that codec is doing is it's taking away information that it thinks we don't actually hear, and it's removing that from the signal and recoding it to something that's smaller. Now, depending on how the codec is set, uh, you know, one of the more common uh, uh, settings for that codec is going to be 128 kilobits per second, right? Right. So the lower the setting, the more information that's going to be taken away. And what kind of information? So you're saying it's not something that technically we're supposed to hear, but what is that information that they're taking away? What is that? That's a good question. And yeah. so that has to deal with psychoacoustic principles and the way that we perceive sound, right? So there's a phenomenon called auditory masking, hmm. right? So certain frequencies are going to mask other frequencies or certain sounds are gonna mask other sounds. And using that principle, it removes content from the file, right? Hmm. And then puts it back together without that content and it makes it a lot smaller. For instance, a 128kbps mp3 is gonna be about 90% smaller than an uncompressed WAV file at 44.1 kilohertz, 16 bits, which is the, the standard for CDs. So that's, that's substantial. A, that is substantial. And so it's psychoacoustic, so that's belong, and that I, I, you mentioned this to me when mm -hmm. we talked about it before, yeah. and I looked up a little bit online, and it, it doesn't seem like that field is totally understood, that research is still being done. There's not, mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of, it's it's literally the field of I think the non it's a technical way of trying to explain the difference between what we hear from an instrument mm -hmm. and what we hear from a recording or, or not even no I mean not even that it's just how we hear and what is, what's going on and what how our brain translates sound right the perception of sound and it's not necessarily the it's not all auditory. There's there's more perception going on than what we can what we perceive as audio. It's it's like a physical. It has an effect on our body. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And you know, let's go back to the 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 128 kbps yes. uh, uh, example. <clears throat> Whenever you take when you're taking away that information, a lot of it's going to be real, real high end content. Yeah. Harmonic content. Got it. Which yeah, we don't necessarily hear that, but we do feel it. Got it. Right? Right. 
And that's probably a lot of what you are experiencing when you record a synth and then it comes back from YouTube and it's undergone whatever compression algorithm codec they're using. You're losing a lot of the feeling of that keyboard because harmonics are being taken away, content's being taken away. Is it still the same frequency? Is it still A440? Absolutely. But depending on what kind of waveform, square wave, triangle, whatever, there is an order of harmonics. And those harmonics, as they move up, well, some of those might be getting shaved away. So you lose, again, the way that keyboard, for lack of a better term, emotes to you. Does that make sense? Makes total sense. And, I, and when you described that when we were talking earlier, like a week or two ago, I, I was like, this makes a lot of sense. This is, and I, that's why I was like, Chris has got to come on and explain <laughs> this. Because I think it's helpful. Um, a question, and this is something I, I didn't ask before, so maybe it's, mm -hmm. you might not know off the top of your head, but are synthesizers, do they, perf is, are there, is there more harmonic content from synthesizers, analog synthesizers, than other instruments? And would you lose more in a recording of a synthesizer than you would, say, a violin or a piano or a guitar? Is, it, is there more at stake with synthesizers, or is this kind of a broadly applicable to any instrument? There you go. Okay. It's broadly applicable to any instrument because the, the, the harmonic order, regardless of the instrument and the limitations of your DAW or your analog to digital converter are going to dictate how the sound is recorded and how it is eventually it's spat out. Got right? it. So if I record, as a rule, I tend to record at 24 bits, 48K. Got right? it. Right? Because yeah. as we move up into the bit depth and into our uh, sample rate, we're going to use up more hard drive space. It becomes expensive. It doesn't, it. It's not expensive like recording analog tape, but it's still expensive, right? So if I'm recording at 48 kilohertz, Ny the Nyquist theorem states that the highest recorded frequency we're going to perceive, not necessarily hear, but perceive, is 24,000 cycles. Now Got the it. range of human hearing is 20 hertz to 20,000 cycles. So 24,000, that's above the range of human hearing. But going back to feeling and emoting, there's things that we feel that we're losing, right? Yeah, yeah. In the analog world, the, the harmonic content can go on forever and ever. Right. Right? But in the digital domain, that doesn't exist. Infinity is not a reality. You, there's limitations. Exactly. Because it's translated. Exactly. So question, and this is another one that, that, and this could just be a personal taste or preference thing. Mm -hmm. I've noticed that with some digital sense, I've actually liked the effect of whatever the effect that's happening in this kind of compression world, um, it's had, um, it sounded better at the end recording than I thought going in when I was in the studio and playing and hearing it through the monitors. Mm -hmm. Is there any, is that just a fluke? Is there any reason that would happen? Or is it? I can't answer that. Okay, so that, <laughs> that, that could be just a fluke thing that I. Well, and it's very subjective too. It's totally subjective. Now, yeah. now you have to remember, you know, if you're playing with the digital synthesizer, that's going to be bound by the rules of digital audio theory as well. So that synthesizer, uh, that's a, a bad, ex a great example, but bad example. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of, you know, what are common sample rates for synthesizers today? 48, 24, right? Let's say you have an analog patch, but it's digitally created. Yeah. Well, it, you're not going to have all that harmonic content that exists from an analog oscillator and an analog filter and signal path. Got it. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So because you're expecting whatever this sounds like when you record it into the digital domain to come back at you feeling like that the way you actually monitor it, yes. that could be part of the issue because the digital synth is probably going to sound the same for the most part. Got it. Right? Because it's limited by it's limited by its sample rate and its bit depth. This is not. This is infinite in nature. Got does it. that make sense? It does. It okay. helps. It. So hopefully I'm not being No, too I think no, I I'm I'm trying to go on all the points that I saw a lot of comments about different I I I'll admit it, I I talk synthesizers up over other instruments. I apologize <laughs> to all the people that play other instruments. I, I have a love for synthesizers and other instruments, but that helped clarify that. And then the other, the digital versus the analog, the effects, I, I had thought perhaps because of um, the harmonics being a little richer in mm -hmm. an analog instrument that the effect of the data compression would be more, 
it would reduce some of the magic. And then with digital, it's less, there's a little less complexity. So maybe it has some other effect that I'm unaware of. That's, I was going, I was leading with that. It doesn't sound like there's anything there. So I just wanted to ask you. And I also want to, you, you said you found out a little bit about how the data compression works at YouTube. Do you, do you want to speak to what you found? I know it wasn't conclusive, but we'd love to hear what you found on that as well. Right, right, right. So, you know, who knows how much of this rings true because, yep. you know, people put stuff up on the internet and people look at that and it's the gospel. <laughs> but from what I found, there are three different algorithms that YouTube is using and they use the algorithms based off of the velocity of your channel or how many views they think the video is going to get, right? So depending on uh, the velocity of the, the views, YouTube's gonna use these three different levels. Uh, and I'm trying to remember what they are. The bottom level is H.264. The middle level is- uh, You said VP1. VP, 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 it's one. AV9 and VP1 is the top level. The AV1, VP9, that was it. Yes. Yeah, one of those things, <laughs> those common, a, AV, AV1, VP9, that was that. In full disclosure, I am not a video expert. I'm an, I'm an audio nerd. And I wouldn't even call myself an expert there. I just love talking about this stuff and it's just, it's so much fun. Um, but depending on what type of, how fast your content moves, it's gonna be assigned to one of those codecs. codecs. And they're in different qualities. Is they're different qualities, so exactly. What the, like exactly. the highest quality one is, did it go into detail about how? It didn't. Okay, so yeah, but, but yeah. basically what you're saying is that there's higher quality codecs for videos that have millions of views and lower quality codecs, codecs for right. ones that don't have as many views. And is there any way for you to tell on a video what uh, what codecs being used? I don't know. I, I, I looked and looked and did not find anything. Did not find I'm sure somebody out there has the answer, obviously. Uh, and the thing about YouTube is they can flip a switch at any time and change these codecs whenever they want. Yeah, there's not they total. They do that quite a bit. And it's not totally forthcoming. So very helpful. I wanted to have this conversation kind of live and it reveals as you guys can see that I am not an audio expert. I love synthesizers, I love instruments, I love their history, but I rely on people like Chris for their expertise and other people on the web. Um, and really the mission of this channel is to make this information more accessible and to start conversations and build community around musical instruments and music technology. Yes. So really would love other people's thoughts, comments. If you could, anything, I hope this conversation was helpful. If there's other information that we missed or that you would like clarification on, please leave a comment below. Would love if there's sleuthers out there that understand YouTube audio and video codecs. This is a beginning point. We're gonna do a few more videos on this. But in, before we conclude in entirety, Chris has actually prepared some examples that we're gonna cut to that show how compression, data compression looks like and sounds like. And he's prepared this, we're gonna cut to it, and then we'll wrap up with some final thoughts. All right, so I did prepare a few audio demos for you to listen to and also to look at using a spectrum analyzer. It's a great technique to have a better understanding of what's happening with your signal. And basically what I've done is I've taken a mono mix of something that I've worked on, right? And I have imported it into a Pro Tool session at a sample rate of 48 kilohertz and a bit depth of 24 bits. And so I have my uncompressed mono signal, right? And then I also converted that to a 128 kbps MP3 and a 160 kbps MP3. So we can actually listen to the differences between the three files. So uncompressed, 128, and 160. So let's listen to the uncompressed file first for just a few bars, about 10 seconds. Now next, let's listen to the 128 kbps mp3 file. And also pay attention to the spectrum analyzer that you're gonna see in the Pro Tools window, because you're gonna see at the top end at about 15k, a lot of content drops off. Got it? Cool.
And last, but certainly not least, let's listen to the 160 kbps mp3 file. You're going to notice that it's going to sound a little better than the 128 kbps file, but not quite as good as the uncompressed native file. You're also going to notice that not quite as much content has been removed in the process. Go ahead and take a look at the Spectrum Analyzer while this plays for about another 10 seconds. So here's where it gets really interesting. What we're going to do now is we're going to take the uncompressed file and the 128 kbps file and we're going to flip one out of phase. Now the result is we're going to hear everything that was removed during the encoding process for the mp3. We're also going to see that content in the spectrum analyzer and if you notice you're going to see that there's actually a boost, right, at about 15k where we saw the dip before when we were listening to it by itself, the, the 128 kbps uh, compressed file. So let's go ahead and do that. And now let's do the same thing for the 160 kbps file where we're going to go ahead and flip the phase and listen to the content that's been removed from the uncompressed file. Now, with both of the uh, files with the content that was removed, I boosted those by 10 dB so you could get a better idea. You could hear what's happening and get a better visual on the Spectrum Analyzer, right? So there's a 10 dB boost to both of those files because I want you to have a better idea of what's happening visually and sonically with your ears. Cool? If you have any questions about what I did with these files and the methodology, please feel free to leave a comment down below. I'll try to get to them as soon as I can, and let's keep this discussion going. So I hope that was helpful in kind of giving some real examples of how data compression sounds and looks. Chris, thank you for, that took a lot of time and effort. I really appreciate it. It yeah, was super helpful for me, and I hope it was helpful for everybody out there. Do you have any kind of final thoughts, conclusions, anything you wanted to say at the end? Uh, wow, that's great. I didn't even really think about that. You know, when you're working with audio, always have yourself in mind. Be pleased with the product before you please anybody else. If that means capturing the highest quality audio, the highest bit rate, 32 floating point, 96K, then do that. Don't pay attention to anything that you read. Just be happy with the content that you're trying to produce, and then everything else will fall into place. At the end of the day, most people are going to probably hear it in some kind of compressed format, but you need to be happy with what you're doing. And I think that is so true for instruments that you choose for recording paths that you take. Music is a thing about personal enrichment and yeah. connecting with others. And at the end of the day, it's fun to talk about this stuff, but don't bang your head against the wall. Don't get in fights about it. You know, if we were made a mistake, don't crucify us. Just, it's a conversation. It's, and it's, we're here to help each other. We're here to connect and it's music. It's fun. Thank you guys for watching. If you have any other comments, thoughts, leave them below. We'd love to see you here again. If you didn't hit subscribe, do so. And if you want to talk more, go to alamomusic.com. We'd love to talk to you more there. And we hope you have a great rest of your day.